Hello and welcome Kingdom citizens. Today we're going to be focusing on velocity banking and your borrowing costs. We're going to really hone in on how we calculate your borrowing costs to make sure and to make sense and to verify that velocity banking will go faster than debt snowball, than debt avalanche, than making extra payment. We always have to use those traditional basic uh, debt payoff strategies as our measuring stick to determine whether or not velocity banking makes any sense whatsoever. At the end of the day, you are leveraging debt. You are borrowing other people's money, OPM. You're now leveraging that money to either pay off a debt or acquire a cash flow vehicle, such as real estate, small business, you name it. The goal is to then create arbitrage where you offset the borrowing costs, your leverage, and produce either A, cash flow, B, interest savings, right? Both in many cases. And it has to go faster than if you were just to use your free cash flow at the end of every month, making that extra payment. Always want to verify that. So what we're gonna do, and I'm gonna show you some ways where you can get around verifying based off of the rates that you have on your debts versus what your borrowing rate is on your debt tool. So let's dive right into the lesson. Here we have on the board a real life financial situation case study here, a client making $4,744 a month, starting with our four major numbers. Expenses are $3,320, total debt $364,617 with a free cash flow of $1,424. With that, we have a unsecured personal revolving line of credit, a PLOC at a credit union. We're in Texas, so we're using a credit union bank in the state of Texas. I think the name was TDECU. I believe that was the name. PLOC for $20,000 at a 7.99% simple interest rate, okay? Simple interest revolving line of credit. 7.99 key details how do we determine what our chunk amount is going to be we look at our rules here these are my fundamental rules other people may use different things but this is what has created a lot of success for my clients myself and many others that watch the channel i do cash flow times 12 boom i get 17,088 for the whole year i then take the personal line of credit 20,000 times that by 66 percent 13,200 my chunk range is anywhere between 13,200 and 17,088, okay? I prefer not to borrow over 66% typically. If I ever borrow above 66%, it'll be because A, my cash flow times 12 is higher than the 66%, or B, the cash flow opportunity, right? Whatever debt i'm trying to pay off let's say the i've got three debts i want to kill and that's a total chunk of fifteen thousand dollars or sixteen thousand dollars and my cash flow gain would be six hundred dollars but if i only did a chunk of thirteen thousand two hundred my cash flow gains only 250 bucks right so in that event i'm willing to go a little bit higher i'm willing to violate my rule because of the cash flow opportunity interest savings right it's usually cash flow interest savings balance third that's usually in the order of how i look at different debts velocity banking overall okay now in this particular situation we don't even have to chunk that high now you may experience this in your own numbers where you're looking at cash flow times 12 66 percent of the line of credit and you're looking at your debts and maybe you're starting off with credit cards and let's say you have a similar chunk range where 66 percent 13,200 but you only have say ten thousand dollars of credit card debt okay well you only have ten thousand and you're looking to consolidate that into the p-lock and there's no other debts no other opportunities i'll leave it alone and just do my 10k chunk so in that particular situation in this particular situation I don't think you're hurting yourself, okay? But we're gonna look a little bit deeper into the numbers here. In this particular case, we've got two credit card debts, two student loans, and a mortgage. That's it, that's all this person has. 
total 364,000, right? So the two credit card debts that they have, charging them both 9.99% simple interest, monthly payment 102, monthly payment 9808. Okay, great. These two student loans are on deferment, no payment required. So no interest is being accrued, no payment required. I skip over it. If it's not, if I have a debt that is not charging me any interest, I never want to use velocity banking, a debt tool that is charging me interest to pay off a debt that is not charging me. That would not make any mathematical sense. I go back to debt snowball and just use free cash flow to do that. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Mortgage is 225,000, too big of a balance to hit. 2.8%, 1669. So this person is making their very first chunk payment doing velocity banking. So I'm taking into consideration that this is a new person practicing a new concept in their life. So to get their feet wet, just by paying off the two credit cards, moving 9.99 to 7.99 is a chunk total of fourth, uh, total chunk of $9,085, okay? Now, if they wanted to, they could do a $13,200 chunk. Now you're wondering, well, where would that difference go, Denzel? She, this person could apply it towards her mortgage, okay? And if you're wondering, well, whoa, 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 7.99 to 2.8, Denzel, does that make sense? When you're dealing with 7.99 simple versus 2.8 amortized, depending on where you are in the loan, it can absolutely make sense and we're gonna prove it over here, right? 2.8% amortized at the top of a mortgage. In this particular case, they're in year 29. So they've, they've only been paying a year into it. They've made no extra payments, just been paying the regular mortgage payment. They're in year 29. So we're at the very, very top of that mortgage. 2.8% is not really 2.8%. It's way higher than that. When you map out the full interest, what it ends up looking like, right? So 7.99 to 2.8 would not make sense if they were at the tail end of the mortgage. They only had 10 years left, 15 years left on the mortgage. They've already paid majority of the 2.8% interest on the 225 mortgage already. The banks already made their money in the first 10 years of the 30 year loan, right? The rest is the principal payback for the most part. You're still paying interest all the way through, but you're paying the bulk of it in the first 10, 15 years, right? So that is when 7.99 would not make sense in regards to 2.8. By then, we wanna upgrade the P-Lock to what? A HELOC, home equity line of credit in the first or second position. That is what would make more sense if I wanted to continue to do velocity banking to pay off all the debt. In some cases, some people will say, huh, 2.8%, Inflation's at 7%, 10%, if not higher. Cost of goods is rising. Taxation is rising. Let me just service the debt, pay the monthly minimum at the 2.8, and I will focus my cash flow on increasing income. You get to that point, there's an argument there. That would make sense if you got to that point, if you came to that conclusion. If not, it's cool. Keep paying your debt off. Either way is gonna produce results. It's a matter of efficiency. How efficient is it for me to pay off 2.8% debt in an environment where inflation is triple that, taxation is quadruple that, devaluation is 5X that, right? So you have to factor those things in as you mature in your personal finances. So with that being said, put that to the side. You've got the debt numbers. We know what our debt tool is. We know our four major numbers. We determine what our first chunk amount is going to be. Now let's look at what is my borrowing cost, Denzel? So $9,085, here's how you do the math, times it by 7.99%. You're gonna get a number. That number is $725.89. If I were to borrow $9,085 from my PLOC and pay the monthly minimum payment for 12 months, I will pay $725.89 at peak at the highest in reality that number will actually be less because when you're making that minimum payment some goes to principal some goes to the interest right the balance doesn't stay the same it goes down so your cost goes down but we're just overestimating 725.89 divide that number by 365 your daily borrowing cost 
which is a more accurate number, your daily borrowing costs for however long you owe $9,085 is $1.98 a day. So if I owe $9,085 for seven days, right? Quick math, 1.98 times seven days, my borrowing cost for seven days is $13.86. $13.86 is very minuscule compared to 7.99 over 365 days. Does that make sense, right? Do you see how your actual borrowing cost is not 7.99? It actually is much less when you map it out on a day-to-day. -day. And that's very important to know because we're not gonna owe $9,085 for the whole year we just move one was consolidate 9.99 9.99 to 7.99 no matter what if all you did from there is that snowball make extra payments now on the 7.99 you would go faster than the person that did not borrow debt that is fact so that right there I don't even have to run that snowball and how I mentioned earlier, how you can get around like not measuring is when the rate of your debt tool is less than what you're paying off. It's an automatic win. You just debt consolidated. There is no cost to open up a P lock. There's no origination fee, right? If there is, you, you don't want that tool. And I've got a tons, tons and tons of videos that explains the different types of debt tools that we prefer on this channel right and the overall use of them so essentially let's go back 9.99 move it to 7.99 i save money and in interest my cash flow dollars are now working stronger if all you did from there was debt snowball you'd go faster than the person that did not borrow done now we amp it up step two is now velocity banking instead of just using all my uh, leftover free cash flow each and every month, we're going to use our entire income to pay off the 9085 extremely fast. So top of the month, let's say we are in February of 2022. That is when I'm recording this video. Let's say I'm at the top of the year. They make their first chunk, top, top of the month, I'm sorry, make their first chunk, 9085, boom, done. 102.98 goes back into their cash flow. Their cash flow increases. Wonderful. Income goes in $4,744 minus it from 985, you're gonna get this number, 4,341. Do the same thing again, your formula on calculating your daily rate, times 7.99%, boom, 346 for the whole year. Look how I just went from 725 to 346, okay? Divide by 365, boom, 95 cents a day. Okay, cool. So when you're running your numbers, this is what you do, you're creating a column, you've got your one area, four major numbers, all your expenses, all your debts, your line of credit, all your rules laid out on one side. Over on the other column is your actual velocity banking. Over to the side, you're logging your borrowing costs on a day-to-day. -day. There's three important numbers throughout every month. The initial chunk amount, that's the first month. The money going in, what the balance goes down to. Money coming out, what the balance goes up to. Those three distinct numbers will help you develop an average daily borrowing costs over a 30 day period, all right? So income goes in, now expenses come out. Expenses are now what? Less by 102 and 9808. So my expenses are now $3,119.92. So expenses come out of the line of credit, brings the balance back up, times it 7.99%, all right? Um, and then, you get 249 divide by 365 okay 68 cents a day got it so at the end of the month the balance should be somewhere around right granted everything goes well seven thousand four hundred sixty dollars ninety two cents okay now you factor in your borrowing costs you take the 198 the 95 cents the 68 cents add the three divide by three you get a dollar 20 a day times by 30 days boom $36.12 a day is your borrowing cost. Add that, okay? And you'll add it to your ending balance. That'll give you a more accurate reading on what the actual ending balance is for that month, for that first chunk month. Now, this number right here, this $24 right here, is if you add a credit card into your 
velocity banking strategy and you're earning anywhere from one to three percent upwards of five percent in cashback rewards on the bills you already have every single month it's not going anywhere it's not changing we know our numbers in this case i took twelve hundred dollars of bills from the three thousand that this person spends each and every month calculated a two percent cashback rewards that's twenty four dollars in cashback rewards each and every month that essentially reduces my borrowing costs even further from 36 down to twelve dollars and twelve cents for one month if you were to just times twelve dollars and twelve cents times 12 months you get 145 dollars and 44 cents in that 12 month period so instead of paying what 725 at 7.99 you pay 145 44 doing velocity banking and when you map out what that results in percentage wise borrowing costs 1.6 percent i ask you would you rather pay 9.99 or borrow at 1.6 to pay off all your debt and if i can retain 1.6 look at that 2.8 which is now less what's less now 1.6 or 2.8 1.6 i just broke down the math for you that's one month i'm sorry that's one year my borrowing costs of nine thousand eighty five dollars if all i did was one chunk in a year i pay 1.6 percent in interest as opposed to 2.8 9.99 in this particular environment 9.99 for the first chunk do you see how that happens this is what you have to do when you're running your numbers okay lay it out on a sheet of paper on a whiteboard map it out you do this a couple times over and over again each and every month my goodness you it, you're gonna get so good at it right so let's just continue down the line to see what our total borrowing costs would be for making that one chunk payment of nine thousand eighty five bucks okay following month this is my balance this is my uh adjusted balance seven thousand four seventy three oh four same thing minus income balance goes down expenses okay money comes out right ending balance five thousand eight forty eight ninety six borrowing cost look how it drops thirty five bucks offset by the twenty four dollars in cashback rewards that following month eleven bucks so you got twelve twelve in month one eleven dollars in borrowing cost month two balance is five thousand 859.96 you went from 985 to 58 two months not bad let's keep it going minus income balance drops expenses out balance goes up borrowing cost drops 24 dollars 47 cents uh-oh cash back rewards is 24 dollars borrowing costs 47 cents in that one month yes you paid 24 but it got offset by this 24 so you really only paid 47 each and every month you have your credit card and you log into the account it accumulates what roughly 24 dollars of running those bills right so you hit the uh redeem right and it sends the 24 dollars to the credit card balance not to the line of credit right send it to the credit card balance itself it reduces what you actually owe on the credit card so it shows up in cash flow that's $24 less that comes out of the line of credit to pay the credit card off in full, which were your bills. So again, recap, line of credit, I make a chunk, I withdraw 985, goes to my checking account, checking account, boom, pays off two credit cards. Great, I recover $102, I recover $98.08. That money now sits in my line of credit from my income. My income is my payment on the PLOC so therefore, I don't have a payment required on the line of credit. There won't be a payment that shows up. Now you have your credit card to run the rest of your bills throughout the month. Your money sits in the line of credit. On the due date of the credit card, bomb. Make the bill, recover the $24 in cashback rewards, submit it, you're done. Rinse, repeat. So we come back here, ending balance, month three, you're down to $4,236.35 cents right look how i did i added 47 cents to that from that number boom got here so one two three three months total borrowing cost 12 12 11 47 cents add the three you're gonna get 23 dollars and 59 cents do the math what's what is the percentage borrowing cost for just those three months alone your chunk amount was 9085 you times that by 0.26 percent 
you get $23.62. Question becomes, would you rather borrow 0.26% to pay off 9.99 or just make extra payments of 1,424 towards 9.99? No matter what, either strategy pays interest. Both strategies, same income, same expenses, same cash flow. Only difference is the borrowing cost. This person borrowed from Peter to pay Paul. When they borrow from Peter at 0.26%, they paid off Paul at 9.99% ahead of time. How long of extra payments, 1424, to pay off 985 in principle, right? 985 in principle divided by 1424 in cash flow. 6.3 months and it would actually take a little longer because 9.99 percent is being tacked onto the balance each and every month so it takes you 6.3 months longer doing debt snowball to pay off these two debts or in one month i remove the debt completely i borrow from peter peter pays paul and i pay 0.26 percent in interest in three months the following month, after month three, there's no more borrowing cost. It's zero, zilch, nada, nothing, right? So if I have a zero borrowing cost, I am ahead of you doing that snowball, making extra payments. Do you see the difference? Is it starting to clarify here? It's starting to, oh, okay. Here's how we properly borrow. Here's how we become an effective borrower where we borrow at nothing, 0%, 1%, 1.6%. It's I know it, what it says, 7.99. When you do the actual math, like I just broke down for you, you can go back and listen to it five times. You're going to come to the same conclusion as me. By month three, month four, my borrowing cost goes to zero. So every month now moving forward, the balance is going down to zero. Around this time, month four, I should be preparing for my next chunk. In this particular situation, we don't know when student loans are going to kick back in. We don't know what the rates are. We don't know what the payment's going to be. So if those kick back in, depending on the rate and the payment, will determine whether or not this person wants to actually go after their student loan debt or leave it alone. In the event, student loan payments four months out continues to be deferred. They push it longer. No interest is being charged. They can now start preparing to make a chunk towards their mortgage at the 2.8%. Again, 7.99 became 0.26. So in reality, their borrowing costs when they make a chunk of at least 9,000 towards their mortgage is only costing them in three months, every three months, only costing them 0.26% for three months. And then the following months, is offset by the cashback rewards. It'll probably take them roughly four to six months to bring that chunk back down to zero. So if they wanted to, not even looking at these rules, they can just make nine, 10, could go a little higher, nine, $10,000 chunks on a four to six month window. So they'll probably get in about two, almost three chunks a year, not including what they're already making on the payment per year on the mortgage. And we can assure ourselves that velocity banking would make sense because if I did two chunks in a year and we know the first three months of each chunk is 0.26%, add 0 0.2 plus 0.2. Now you're at 0.52%. You're at a half a percent of cost for the whole year to make two chunks of 985. 985 times 2, 18,170 plus your 1669 times 12, right? You're at 38,000 shaved off the 225. Now, in this case, knowing that information, we want to chunk more because it's at 2.8% the debt. The cost we determined was like a half a percent. So we can keep going up and up and up not too high right here's where my rule comes back in if they did 13,200 times 2 that's 26,400 plus 1669 times 46,000 that can be done in the same year you see how that happens now here's the here's the key though you don't want to stay in that line of credit forever 
you eventually, like this is good for probably the first year, year and a half, maybe two years tops of doing velocity banking on the mortgage tops because she's gonna create so much equity in the property in the first year, year and a half, almost two, that it would be unwise not to convert the P-lock, put that off onto the side, put it on the shelf. Okay, great. You can treat that as your emergency fund, right? Put that off to the side and go get a HELOC at a three, four percent interest rate, three to four, maybe five. But in this environment, three to four is like the range lately. So if I get a four percent simple interest home equity line of credit, you just do the same math all over again. You're going to be able to say, yes, four percent over 2.8 makes sense because I was able to make sense of it at 7.99 for the first one to two years. And again, once you're probably gonna eliminate in those first two years, probably gonna eliminate almost five to nine years or more off the, the mortgage. This is in year 29, probably get down to like year 15 or something like that, right? When you really play the numbers out. So at that point, even the HELOC in the second position at a 4% rate may become obsolete, not advantageous, where again, that 2.8%, once you've paid up all the interest in advance by eliminating the principal in advance, now you effectively reduce that 2.8 even less. Now it's no longer really 2.8. It's now dropping because you paid principal up front in advance. You canceled the interest from, a, from accruing, from amortizing on you. So again, at that point, you got to come to the conclusion and say, okay, been doing velocity banking now for two years, three years, and my debt tool is at 4%, my mortgage is at 2.8, you need to evaluate. Does it make sense for me to continue down this path? Possibly, right? Because you can actually prove it. Your 4% is not really 4%, it's more like 1.2, 1.5. As long as it's under 2.8, you're winning. When you effectively always borrow and evaluate what the borrowing cost is for that period. Four to six months is typically the average length to make a chunk and pay back the chunk in full. It's usually four to six, six to nine months. I'm sorry, six to nine months. If you're in four to six, you're doing phenomenal. Six to nine months is usually the range, which makes it about roughly two, almost three chunks per year. Some people do four, right? It just depends on, again, your four major numbers. So as long as you can run the number, check your math, look at the borrowing costs. If you're rate says 4%, 7%, 9%, and it's simple interest, and then you do a chunk and you map out what that cost was, if it went down to 2.8, 3, 2%, and let's say you were paying off a debt at 5% and you're borrowing at 7.99, all you have to do is prove that your actual borrowing costs was less than 5% and also beats that snowball, okay? Because now you gotta do both. But if your line of credit, your debt tool, is at a lesser rate than the debt you're trying to pay off, right? If you got a 7.99 line of credit and you're paying off a debt at 10%, that makes sense. You don't have to re-verify. You're already, you're already consolidated. Now you use the velocity banking. You bring that 7.99 down to what I just did here between one and 2%, probably less than that in reality. Add the credit card, cashback rewards, you're in a very good position, okay? You eventually, this happens most of the time, most of my clients, you wipe out all your consumer debt, credit cards, loans, personal loans, business loans, um, car loans, right? All that stuff, and now you're just left with the mortgage. And you're thinking in your head, well, my mortgage is only at 0.8%, 3%, 2% flat. I'm seeing ridiculously low rates. Inflation's at 7%, if not higher, in reality. Okay, food and gas alone increased by 50%. You have taxation and devaluation, okay? On top of that, at that point, you ask yourself, does it make sense for me to do this velocity banking concept to pay off 2.8% when inflation's at seven? Meaning, when you map out, it takes you three to five years, five to seven years to pay off your mortgage. Yeah, you saved 2.8%, 3%, but your cash flow is now worth 40% less over a four year period. If inflation stood at 10% year over year, okay? 10, 10, 10, 
you got a cash flow gain of a thousand for paying off that debt, your purchasing power is now really six hundred dollars. Does that make sense? So you have to evaluate. Does it make sense for me to throw my cash flow at this debt over here where it's going to burn and die? Or do I now shift from trying to get completely out of debt to now just servicing the debt at 2.8 because of inflation, taxation, devaluation? How about I focus on increasing my income by over 10% year over year? That's just to stay ahead. If I increase my income by 30%, 40%, 50%, if I take on the whole 10x model, go from making 4K a month to 40,000 a month, fail miserably, get 50% of the way there, you're making 20 grand a month, right? Get 25% of the way there, get to 20, you're triple quadrupling your income. You got more cash flow to work with, puts you in a better financial position. In that same three to five years, it would have taken you to get out of debt doing debt snowball, debt avalanche, velocity banking at year 4.9 at year uh you know like it let's just say it took you four years to get out of debt doing that snowball three years to get out of debt doing velocity banking and you decided to shift that model to increase your income at year 2.9 you can just write a check pay off all the debt in full but see now you're debt free and your income is four five six seven ten x higher in that same time frame you choose. Got a lot of people that watch this channel between the ages of 35, 55 years old. You're thinking to yourself, okay, I'm 55 years old. I want to retire, but I want to be debt free by 60. Okay, that's cute. You're going to be debt free by 60. You spent all the rest of your working years paying off the debt, but not increasing your income. Now you're debt free and broke. And now you're not as strong, not as healthy. You're older. It may be even harder to teach that old dog new tricks. So when I'm working with clients, I meet you where you're at. You tell me, Denzel, I wanna be debt free. Great, I'm not gonna argue with you. I'm gonna show you the strategy. I'm gonna show you the options. You pick, go. Okay, first year, you do phenomenal. Second year, doing great. You start watching more of my videos. You come across a video like this. You, I start piquing your interest. You're like, hmm, okay, Denzel, I'm 57 years old. 58 years old, I got hmm, maybe seven more years in the tank before my back's gonna give out and I just, I gotta retire. Wife's gonna be upset that I'm still working and she wants to travel the country and do all these wonderful things. Well, if you got seven years in the tank, velocity banking, debt snowball, whatever it is that's saying, you're gonna be debt free in five years or less. You're only giving yourself two more years to increase your income, you may fall short. So that's where the strategy might shift. You say, okay, if I, you know, two years of doing velocity banking, infinite banking, whatever financial strategy you're taking on, once you develop that discipline, you know your number, you know where your money is going, you know what's coming in, what's going out, you've got savings, you, you're in a good financial position. You may want to take, especially for my 50 and up, 60, you're you're approaching that retirement, you only got a couple years left in the tank before it's, before you, you know, you gotta retire, whatever the case may be, whatever your situation is. You may wanna consider giving it that fourth quarter, your last best shot to increase your income, even though you're still gonna be in debt, increase that income, you'll have plenty of money to pay off the debt right when as you retire okay you get to make that choice i'm gonna direct our attention to the board again one last time so you can look at all the numbers pause review rewind go back okay my name is denzel rodriguez hope you have a wonderful day god bless talk to you soon